good evening and welcome to the daily recap of day one of AHA Scientific Sessions 2020. I'm Don Lloyd-Jones. I'm the chair of the Committee for Scientific Sessions program for AHA. And I'm joined tonight by three colleagues, Dr. Beacon Boskert, who is a heart failure specialist and director of the Heart Failure Center at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Manesh Patel, my uh, wonderful sidekick, the vice chair of the Committee on Scientific Sessions program. And of course, AHA president, Dr. Mitch Elkin, who is a neurologist, a stroke neurologist at uh, Columbia. Uh, thank you all for joining me tonight. Really looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank so, you. Uh, want to also reach out to all of our great attendees today. Uh, we had a little Friday the 13th glitch on some of the website issues uh, during the networking hour. We're so sorry about that, but uh, we'll chalk it up to Friday the 13th and uh, ready to move ahead and very excited to see the additional science tonight. So we started off the day with what for me was just an incredibly special opening session. Uh, the, the, what we saw from uh, Drs. Brownwald and and Wenger, uh, guided by Dr. Yancey and, and Harrington, was really special. Mitch, your thoughts about the opening session? Absolutely, Don. You know, I have to say, watching that fireside chat was incredible. You know, there may not have been a fire burning, but it certainly was personal, intimate, and heartfelt. A big debt of gratitude to Bob Harrington and Clyde Yancey for, for leading that conversation. Um, Dr. Brownwald shared reflections from his childhood fleeing the Nazis, and he reflected on how currently we're engaged in a different kind of war against COVID. And I thought one of the interesting points he made uh, was that during World War II, there was unity among Americans, while this war against COVID has driven us apart in many ways. And uh, he also discussed the impact of World War II on the workforce of science and medicine, and in particular, how it brought so many women uh, into science during the war. And then Dr. Wenger picked up on that theme, describing how COVID has had a disproportionate impact on women, uh, women in science and in medicine, perhaps in the opposite direction, since women, in her words, have been forced to become, quote, housekeepers, teachers, and playground monitors during the pandemic. So in other words, many women were forced out of the scientific workforce. And so she rightly called for an increased role for women in positions of leadership in medicine and science. And uh, her stories about her early career when medicine was highly segregated were extremely moving. And she made the point that the social justice movement now has a much greater basis of support among people, uh, sort of a broad segment of the population than even during the civil rights movement. So her reflections on working to end structural racism, I thought resonate a lot with the mission of the Heart Association. So it was a really terrific session for brilliant leaders representing different generations in cardiovascular medicine, just terrific. Yeah, I can't remember a session that's more special or that has really moved me more than that. Uh, it was just such a great way to start. Um, but of course, there was a lot of great programming today, lots of the wonderful science, and we're gonna highlight a little bit of that for you now. Um, and uh, we had our first late-breaking science session uh, focusing on some heart failure trials and a trial of prevention of atrial fibrillation. Let's highlight a little bit from late-breaking science session one, particularly focusing on the galactic and affirm trials. So if I can get the slides up, thanks very much. Um, this uh, first one we'll highlight is galactic HF. This was omicamptiv macarbal, a new drug that's a uh, uh, cardiac myosin activator, so it enhances cardiac contractility. Uh, this was a study of about 8,000 patients, as you can see, all HEFREF patients, um, pretty typical stable chronic heart failure patient population. And what they found was a statistically significant, though somewhat modest, 8% reduction in the composite event of first heart failure or cardiovascular death. And interestingly, they found relatively consistent uh, uh, effects of the drug, uh, although there was one uh, significant interaction between, uh, and it was, it was around the median ejection fraction. So those with an ejection fraction less than or equal to 28% uh, showed greater benefits uh, compared with those with an ejection fraction greater than 28%. So uh, again, subgroup analyses, gotta be a little bit careful, but an interesting uh, suggestion here of a, of a significant finding. The second trial uh, we're going to highlight is the AFFIRM-AHF trial. 
this uh, uh, now finally gives us some solid, large clinical trial data of iron supplementation in patients with heart failure, hospitalized heart failure, and iron deficiency anemia. There have been some suggestions. This is really the first trial that pushes us to understand whether treating that will actually improve outcomes. And sure enough, uh, as you see, there was a uh, borderline statistically significant reduction in the primary outcome, the usual heart failure outcome of heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death. P-value is 0.059, but I would note that this trial, the ending of this trial was significantly affected by COVID. And looking at some of the secondary endpoints like just heart failure hospitalizations or looking at the, um, the COVID adjusted analysis, they do see statistical significance and some nice, uh, I think, consistent findings. No effect on cardiovascular death overall. And uh, interestingly, importantly, no adverse events really associated with this drug. So could it be additional therapy? So with that, uh, let me turn to Dr. Boskertz and uh, Vikram, you were actually involved in Thank this you. session. What, what did you see? And, and tell us what you think the implications are for heart failure therapy. Thank you, Don. As to where we stand with the heart failure therapies, uh, in the aftermath of the landmark DAPA-HF and emperor reduced HF trials, uh, we know that SGLT2 inhibitors have become part of the standard therapy of HEFREP, along with RASI inhibitors, uh, beta blockers, and MRA. Uh, I believe after the standard therapy with these four classes of medications, we will likely treat patients according to their phenotypes and or comorbidities and may adjust therapies according to specific etiology. Now, coming back to the phenotype, galactic HF trial demonstrated, as you mentioned, a modest improvement in the combined endpoint of heart failure events and cardiovascular death with omecaptive in certain phenotype of HEFREF patients. The trial itself uh, recruited uh, patients who are either currently admitted or with recent, in the last one year, history of heart failure hospitalization or requiring urgent care visit. So probably a sicker population than the, the traditional ambulatory patient population. They also had to have elevated anti-proBNP. Interestingly, uh, the, the primary endpoint was significant uh, in terms of risk reduction in the order of about 8%. The components of the, um, the primary endpoint did, didn't reach significance either for hospitalizations or cardiovascular death. There was another uh, secondary endpoint that was of uh, uh, importance for us, for the patients as well as for the clinicians, the quality of life. Nominally, the quality of life improved, but the hierarchical p-value that the investigators set was 0.02, which this trial uh, marginally missed. Uh, they they reached 0.029, and thus the quality of life improvement couldn't be met. Um, the other important finding uh, is the inclusion-exclusion criteria. Galactic allowed enrollment of patients uh, down to a systolic blood pressure of 85, excluded only less than 85, and EGFR less than 20. As you know, most of our trials excluded patients uh, with that borderline blood pressure of less than 100. It was overall safe. Contrary to the COSMIC uh, phase two trial, the myocardial ischemic events were not increased, but there was a mild increase in the troponin I levels, 0 0.004. The clinical uh, you know, importance of this is to be debated, but not seeing the event raise uh, in terms of the ischemic events on stable angina is quite of a relief. Um, importantly, there was no reduction in blood pressure. It was not expected and no other adverse effect on the kidney, not expected, no electrolyte abnormalities or ventricular arrhythmias. The heterogeneity that was seen in lower EF actually is probably convincing that this uh, agent may be of merit or benefit in maybe sicker population. Therefore, we will need to hear a little bit more for, with further analysis from this trial to see whether those um, uh, uh, subgroup analyses on the forest plot, which looks a little bit more effective in the NYJ class 3, 4, as well as elevated anti-pro BNP levels are going to pan out. But it looks like heterogeneity only existed for EF less than 20, 28%. We have another recent trial in 2020 that targeted a similar sicker patient profile. That was the Victoria trial with Verisigwat, um, which... Uh, 
uh, enrolled patients with recent hospitalization or requirement for IV diuretics and markedly, markedly elevated natural pe peptide levels. In this trial, there is Siguat, uh, which is an oral guanylate cyclase uh, simulator, was associated with, very similarly, improvement in the combined endpoint of uh, cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, uh, which was attributable predominantly due to heart failure hospitalization reduction. The risk reduction was about 10%. The difference between the uh, Galactic HF and Victoria was the inclusion criteria. Uh, Victoria excluded patients with systolic blood pressure less than 100, and Vericiguat, as a side effect, resulted in a reduction in blood pressure. And thus, the profiles differ in that, uh, in that domain. The other feature is um, there I'm was gonna, heterogeneity I'm gonna, I'm gonna also. Jump in. Uh, just going to sure. jump in for a second because we got a bunch of stuff to cover. Um, let me ask sure. you very quickly. Um, you going to use uh, ferric carboxybaltase on your hospitalized heart failure patients or no? Um, in heart failure patients, yes. Whether hospitalized is the only one because this study is confirmatory of what we have seen with the former trials, which were also our patients. Thus, uh, I think it's supportive. It didn't reach its primary endpoint. I know the P, uh, P was borderline. It was safe. So I'm going to use it for heart failure patients. Where I, whether I'm going to start it in the hospital, I might, because it's an intravenous medication at this point, and continue it after discharge versus uh, bring the patient as an outpatient, I think is uh, both feasible approaches. It's supportive of the former data for reduction yeah. in hospitalization. Great. Thanks so much. Manesh? Yeah, well, maybe, Don, that, you know, going from heart failure, maybe if I'll go into late-breaking session two, which was, importantly, I think a one trial to highlight was the TIPS-3 trial, and I think there's some slides up that you can see here. Uh, this is something we've been awaiting, Don, the polypill outcomes trial, and just to remind everybody about this trial, it was uh, 5,700 patients randomized in uh, several middle-income countries that received the polypill, and... Um, and I guess the, the polypill, remembering everybody that what's in the polypill was um, importantly ACE inhibitor, statin, uh, beta blocker, uh, and hydrochlorothiazide. And then it was a two-by-two two randomized trial as often, uh, you know, our colleagues at PHRI, Dr. Yusuf and others do, um, it was uh, aspirin was the other arm. So as you can see in the slides here, the polypill versus placebo did have a reduction in, in uh, cardiovascular events with a hazard ratio about 0.79. The addition of aspirin in the polypill, so the combination then again, also reduced cardiovascular events, um, as you can see in the slide here, the hazard ratio is about 0.69. And if you go to the next slide here, you'll see that um, so there was a pre-specified endpoint to look at the primary endpoints and to look at angina. Again, aspirin seemed to help that. And the last sort of finding, you know, there's no free lunch done, so we always wonder about polypill and aspirin. Was there an increase in GI bleeding or major bleeding, at least in this trial in these uh, patients? Again, for prevention, it wasn't. So I, I think an important step in moving the field of prevention forward and an uh, important outcomes trial there. Yeah, I totally agree, Manesh. Uh, you know, I think this, this we've been waiting for a polypill outcomes trial. And I think a couple of things I noted, one, not all polypills are the same, right? So the, right. the composition of the polypill does matter, I think. Um, but this is uh, uh, consistent with what we've seen in the intermediate endpoint trials. Now we've got a big international trial that shows us uh, benefit. I think polypills are here to stay. We need to think about the, the composition. And I think the aspirin data are really interesting. Um, you know, recent trials in well-resourced settings uh, where patients are already being treated and have their cholesterol and blood pressure well controlled, aspirin does not seem to add a lot of net benefit. And what I mean by net benefit is, yeah, still does reduce cardiovascular events, but offset by bleeding. In this setting, sort of a less resourced setting, where patients are getting all things started at the same time, aspirin does seem to add a little bit of value. So I think that that debate will rage, but, um, but uh, polypills, I think, do represent a very interesting and effective strategy for population-based approaches to prevention. Well, so, Don, I know we're running, uh, know we're running short on time, do? so I'll just go into a couple more um, quick yeah. ones. Um, in the other featured sciences, it was important to recognize that today we also had the ARREST trial presented a phase two single center open label randomized trial of advanced reperfusion strategies using ECMO and out of hospital cardiac arrest compared to usual care. A single center in Minneapolis, uh, 30 patients stopped early by the DSMB for benefit. We'll have to see that in bigger centers, multiple places to see if that holds. And then of course, tomorrow I'm looking ahead at uh, late breaking session three, where I, I know we're gonna see important studies involving um, myocardial uh, infarction without obstructive coronary disease, Minoka, 
Uh, we're going to see an in-depth study there. We're going to see ticaglor versus clopidogrel in elective PCI, Alpheus, and we're going to see rivaroxaban in patients with AFib and prosthetic mitral valve. So a lot of interesting stuff coming tomorrow. But I'd be interested, uh, you know, we're all looking forward, Mitch, to uh, the presidential session. Maybe you can give us a little bit of a teaser on what that's going to hold tomorrow. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, I'll just throw in about the uh, TIPS-3 trial. The other thing I noticed there is that stroke was uh, really markedly decreased, especially with aspirin, I think. So I thought that was kind of interesting and suggest there may be a special role there for stroke prevention. Um, just had to throw that in there. But uh, yeah, I appreciate that, Manesh. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to say too much about the uh, presidential session because I'm afraid then, who knows, people won't show up. Uh, so maybe uh, I'll, I'll jump over my own uh, Connor lecture tomorrow. I hope people do come to hear that. Um, but I do want to tell you that we'll also hear from Nancy Brown, the American Heart Association CEO, who will describe many of the new programs that the AHA is launching, including several very exciting research initiatives. And I'm sure people are going to want to hear about those. We'll also, of course, be giving several awards, including the Eugene Brownwald Award to Dr. Nanette Wenger, which kind of brings us full circle, I think. So I hope everybody gets a good rest tonight and uh, is ready to kick off tomorrow morning for day two.